High up in Southern California's gorgeous San Gabriel Mountains lie deposits of precious gemstones, corundum and lapis lazuli. These deposits at Cascade Canyon are an excellent place to rock hound, and they allude to the complex and eventful geology going on underfoot in the San Gabriels and throughout the entirety of Southern California. This is the story of the San Gabriel Mountains and their precious gemstone deposits. The San Gabriel Mountains are an east-west trending mountain range in Southern California, running just north of Los Angeles from Tijon Pass on Interstate 5 to Cajon Pass on I-15. They're part of a larger system of mountain ranges known as the Transverse Ranges, which includes other nearby ranges such as the San Bernardino, Santa Monica, Santa Inez, and Topa Topa Mountains. The Transverse Ranges lie south of the Sierra Nevada and north of the Peninsular Ranges. The highest point in this system of mountains is the 11,502-foot Mount San Gorgonio in the San Bernardino Mountains, while the high point of the San Gabriels is Mount San Antonio, standing at 10,064 feet above sea level. The oldest rocks that outcrop in the San Gabriels are 1.7 billion-year-old gneisses from the Proterozoic Eon near the summit of the aforementioned Mount San Antonio. These highly metamorphosed rocks attribute their genesis to the western margin of the North American craton. In geology, a craton is a fancy word for saying the main nucleus of a continent. After this cratonic rock was deposited, western North America experienced an extended period of rifting, thinning the continental crust and plunging the area beneath the ocean. What would become the San Gabriel Mountains was under a shallow sea for hundreds of millions of years. During its underwater tenure in the Paleozoic era, large amounts of limestone, dolostone, shale, mudstone, and sandstone were deposited. This is central to the formation and deposition of the San Gabriel corundum and lapis, as the host rocks of the gemstones are highly metamorphosed marble, schist, and quartzite that originated as these marine sediments. Corundum is a precious gem that has the chemical formula Al2O3, its aluminum oxide. Red corundum is known as ruby, while the blue variety is sapphire, and the type that occurs at Cascade Canyon is ruby, kind of. It's a beautiful reddish-pink-purplish color, due to enrichment of chromium, and if you squint hard enough, you might be able to consider it red enough to be called ruby. Corundum is considered a precious gem due to its rarity, as it only forms in very specific conditions that have to be just right in chemistry, temperature, and pressure. It's also one of the hardest minerals, clocking in at a 9 on the Mohs Hardness Scale. On the Mohs Hardness Scale, the higher the number, the harder the mineral is, meaning that it'll scratch minerals that are softer than it. Talc is considered a 1 on the aforementioned scale, making it the softest known substance. On the other hand, diamond is a 10, making it the hardest known substance in the universe. Anyways, corundum only forms in aluminum-rich rocks at high temperatures of roughly 500 to 800 degrees Celsius under high amounts of pressure. One of the most beautiful things about minerals, besides, you know, looking at them, is that we can use their presence to help piece together the geologic story underfoot. So, what metamorphosed these rocks to such a high degree to form corundum? During the beginning of the Mesozoic Era, roughly 252 million years ago, the area began to transition from a passive shallow sea to an active plate boundary. The Farallon Plate began subducting off the coast of North America, building a massive volcanic arc similar to today's Cascade Range, and continued from about 250 to 30 million years ago in what would become the San Gabriel Mountains. This tectonic process laid the bedrock of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, the Transverse Ranges, and the Peninsular Ranges, in placing colossal amounts of plutonic igneous rock, mainly in the form of granite and granodiorite. The granites and granodiorites of the area represent the felsic core of the aforementioned ancient volcanic arc, as the volcanic rock that erupted out of the area during the Mesozoic has since eroded, exposing the core of the arc. The massive amounts of subterranean magma that intruded the area during this time came into contact with the pre-existing sedimentary rocks from the Paleozoic, contact metamorphosing them as the hot magma altered the chemistry of the minerals in the sedimentary rocks. As the magma erupted to the surface, it buried these marine sediments. 
Additionally, the immense pressure that these sedimentary rocks endured for 200 million years as the Farallon Plate slammed into the North American Plate folded and deformed them, regionally metamorphosing them into marbles, schists, and quartzites. Due to the fact that these marine rocks were now buried at great depth under the magmatic rocks from the Farallon Arc, the intense temperature and pressure applied to them allowed them to behave ductilely. Rather than shattering brittily, they flowed like plastic, becoming foliated. In short, these metasedimentary rocks got double plowed, both by the heat of the magma that was forced into them and by the immense pressure of an oceanic plate slamming into them. This 200 million year episode of metamorphism at the hands of both intense heat and pressure facilitated the necessary conditions to form corundum. The chemistry aspect was already taken care of. The Paleozoic sediments were rich in aluminum, and the magma from the Farallon Arc introduced even more aluminum into the system. So that explains how the corundum was formed in these metasedimentary rocks. But if they were buried miles into the earth by magmatic rock that erupted above them, and by the Farallon plate slamming into North America, how the heck did they get exhumed to the surface of the earth for us to be able to go out and collect their rubies? The answer lies in California's Big Bad Wolf, the San Andreas Fault. You see, the San Andreas Fault bounds the San Gabriel Mountains to the north, and the forces that fuel the fault are responsible for much of Southern California's topography. As I previously mentioned, what would become Southern California was an active subduction zone from about 250 to 30 million years ago, and when subduction ended, the San Andreas Fault was formed. This is because the Farallon Plate fully subducted in this localized area 30 million years ago, and the North American Plate was now bounded by the Pacific Plate in what would become Southern California. Rather than being a convergent plate boundary, Southern California was now a transform plate boundary, the two tectonic plates sliding past each other rather than smashing into each other. As this commenced, the crust of the Earth in the area was dragged, rotated, sheared, and deformed. The San Gabriel Mountains are the poster child of these processes attributed to the San Andreas Fault. Within the past 30 million years, they have moved 100 miles northwest and have been rotated roughly 90 degrees, which is why they are east-west trending rather than north-south trending like the majority of the mountain ranges in California and North America. Additionally, they've been sutured onto the Pacific Plate. Though their bedrock formed on North America, the San Andreas Fault System has moved them to a completely new tectonic plate. If you look at a map of the San Andreas Fault, you might notice that it bends in east-west fashion, similar to how the San Gabriel Mountains are oriented in this area of Southern California, and that is no coincidence. This is because after the Farallon Plate finished subducting here 30 million years ago, a large block of crust was broken off of North America, and was rotated 40 to 100 degrees, opening up basins in the area such as the Los Angeles Basin. This process formed the east-west bend in the San Andreas Fault Zone that runs from Palm Springs to Maricopa. Due to this east-west bend in an otherwise north-south trending transform plate boundary, an area of compressional stress was generated as the Pacific Plate continues to move north. The aforementioned rotated crustal block is now being rapidly uplifted due to this compressional stress here, thus forming the San Gabriel Mountains and other ranges in the transverse ranges. I just want to make it clear that when I say this crust was rotated, I mean it was vertically rotated, as if flat land rotated 90 degrees and became a cliff. This is what happened to the bedrock here, thus exposing the Paleozoic metamorphic rocks and Precambrian basement that was buried by the Farallon Arc in its batholith. This vertical rotation is what opened the Los Angeles Basin, occurring due to the Farallon Pacific North American Triple Junction passing under here 30 million years ago, breaking off and rotating that giant block of crust. As the Pacific Plate moves north today, the Los Angeles Basin is closing up and the transverse ranges are being uplifted. This process continues to this day, as thrust faults such as the Sierra Madre Fault Zone and the Cucamonga Fault are still actively building the San Gabriel Mountains. This mountain building event is known as the Pasadena Orogeny, and interestingly enough, the infamous 1994 magnitude 6.7 Northridge earthquake occurred on one of these thrust faults in the system, and actually raised the San Gabriel Mountains elevation by one foot. In a nutshell, this is how those deeply buried corundum-bearing metamorphic rocks in the San Gabriels were exhumed to the surface of the Earth. They were tirelessly uplifted throughout the last 30 million years. 
The San Gabriel Mountains are one of the fastest growing mountain ranges in the world, growing about 2 inches per year on average. With that being said, they also have some of the highest erosion rates in the United States. This leads to very steep topography, which is highly evident and visible in Cascade Canyon and around the range in general. This brings me to my final point about the corundum deposits in the range. As of now, the only unit where corundum is known to occur is actually in a landslide deposit that dates back to the Pleistocene, roughly 2.6 million to 11,000 years ago. No one has found the actual bedrock where this corundum occurs, suggesting that it's probably been fully eroded away and only exists in these landslide deposits, a true testament to the rapid uplift and erosion of the San Gabriel Mountains. I spent this whole time only mentioning corundum and completely ignoring lapis lazuli, and this is because corundum is a better indicator mineral for the whole geologic story going on here than lapis lazuli, which isn't even a mineral. Don't get me wrong, lapis is important too, but lapis mainly forms as a result of contact metamorphism in marble, and knowing that, I couldn't tell the whole story of the San Gabriels through lapis. I had to tell it through corundum. The lapis that you can find in the San Gabriels occurs in Paleozoic marble that was contact metamorphosed by Cretaceous granitic intrusions roughly 80 million years ago. The San Gabriel Mountains are one of only three locations in the entire US where you can find lapis lazuli. Also, lapis lazuli is technically not a mineral. It's considered a metamorphic rock, composed of a melange of minerals such as lazurite, sodalite, pyrite, and calcite. The mineral lazurite gives it that royal blue color. Now that we've learned all about the geology of the San Gabriel Mountains and these mineral deposits, let's get rock hounding on the next episode of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures. If you enjoy content like this, please like the video and subscribe to the channel, and check out some of our other adventures right here. As always guys, thanks again and peace!